my wife Christine and I both became Christians in college through, I mean, you could say through an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ, or that's what it was called then. It's called Crew Now. Her story is that she was a freshman and she was in the sorority house and a couple of the women in the house said they're going to start a Bible study. Was anybody interested? And she was kind of the overachiever, be involved in everything your first year on campus. And so she said, sure, I'd love more information. And that led to two women in the Tridel house here at Mizzou sitting down with her and going through something called the four spiritual laws. You may have seen this before. It's been around forever. Uh, we're not interested in all the four laws today. We're just going to talk about one of them. The first one is this. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, that's great news, isn't it? I mean, who doesn't want a wonderful life? Now, here's the deal. Is the booklet never explained what that wonderful life looked like? That was kind of left to the person's imagination. But you and I, we can imagine a wonderful life, right? It's, you know, where we get all the things we want. Health and friends and marriage and kids and career and vacations. You know, a long, prosperous life, however you define it, followed by a quick and painless death. But then you start reading your Bible, and you know a little bit about church history, and you go, man, I, I'm thinking that God's definition of wonderful life might be a little different than mine. And you don't have to get very far. I mean, just look at Jesus. Jesus always did the will of God, right? He never strayed from God's word, his ways. He, he always did what was right, following God perfectly. But can you imagine sitting down with Jesus when he was early in his life and say, Jesus, God's got a wonderful plan for your life. I mean, would you have wanted Jesus' wonderful life? Grew up in poverty. His community made fun of him. They called him illegitimate because his parents had him. His mom gave birth to him before his parents were married. Then as he got older, he was always at odds with the religious leaders, and they kept trying to kill him. He eventually is deserted by his friends, betrayed by one of them, arrested, beaten to within an inch of his life, and then crucified. Hashtag blessed. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't quite fit, does it? I, I think we're supposed to look at Jesus' life and what we're supposed to learn, what we're supposed to take away is that being a Christian is costly. Being a Christian can really be difficult sometimes. So does God want a wonderful plan for your life? Is that his plan? Well, yeah, but it depends on how you define it. The Apostle Paul made a habit of going through uh, kind of town cities, telling people about Jesus, and then starting churches. And then every once in a while, he had to go back to some of the same places he planted a church, maybe a couple years later or something, and, and check in on them and see how they were doing, kind of encourage them. So Luke uh, writes about that in Acts 14. It says, They preached the gospel in that city, won a large number of disciples, then they return, so this is a place they've already been, to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. And the purpose of the trip was to strengthen the disciples and encourage them to remain true to the faith. So, of course, Paul, he spent a lot of time in these places. He, he talked to them for days, but Luke can't tell us everything Paul said. So he just kind of sums up. Like, when, when Paul was there strengthening the churches, encouraging them in their faith, what, if you had to boil it all down to one sentence, what was Paul's message to them? Okay, here it is. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. That was it. That was Paul's message to strengthen them and their faith. Now, I, I don't know that that makes a great marketing campaign, right? But it does have the advantage of being accurate and honest. See, there's a, there's a different take on that law one. Here, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but of course you might get eaten by the lions, right? Right? God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but there are gonna be a lot of hardships. And for some Christians, that meant being in the Colosseum under threat of their life. What does following Jesus cost you? After Christine and I had been Christians like, uh, for a couple years, like I said, we became Christians in college, then we went on this mission trip. It's kind of where I met her. We were on this mission trip overseas, and it was in a country called Hungary. Now, this is a long time ago. There was an iron curtain, metaphorically an iron curtain that separated East and Western Europe. And on the east side of the iron curtain, it was Soviet-dominated empire. There was no freedom, like no freedom to travel, no freedom to, uh, uh, to kind of freedom of expression, no freedom of religion, none of that. It was an atheistic empire. 
And, and so we're over there behind this wall, couldn't tell anybody where we were going, and we're, and we're talking to people about Jesus. We're in the country of Hungary where there's a bunch of people who'd come and go to this lake. And uh, uh, for the first time, people were hearing about Jesus and understanding it because they'd grown up in this atheistic empire, and they were putting their faith in him. But there were three girls. I think they were like late high school. They were from a country called Czechoslovakia, which doesn't even exist anymore. That's how much the world has changed. But they were from Czechoslovakia, again, atheistic, dominated by the Soviets. And, and they would come and they would talk to the girls on our team about Jesus. And they were super interested. And you thought they were going to believe. But they, they'd go like, well, I don't know. We could go talk. So they'd go back and they'd talk in their place. And maybe the next day they'd come back. They'd ask more questions about Jesus. You thought they were going to believe and become a Christian. But then, ah, no. And they'd go back. And they did it over and over until finally they come. They go, okay, we're ready. We're ready to believe in Jesus. We're ready to become Christians. So after the kind of, you know, everybody's excited and all they, the girls on our team, they just ask, like, what took you so long? Why back and forth? What were you all discussing? They go, well, you see, in our country, we have to fill out an application for everything. And on every application, it's going to ask us, are you a Christian? So when we want to go to college, it's going to ask us, are you a Christian? And if you mark yes, you probably won't get into college. When, when we have to apply to get a job, there it's going to say, are you a Christian? And if you say yes, you're probably not going to get that job. When you want to get an apartment, like a place to live, there's going to be an application you have to fill out, and it's going to ask, are you a Christian? And if you mark yes, you're probably not going to get that apartment. So following Jesus is going to cost us a lot, and we kept going back and talking about, is he worth it? Is this worth it? And we've decided that although it's going to cost us where we live and where we work and whether we get to go to school, it's going to cost us. But Jesus is worth it. We want to be his followers. Many of us, we grew up learning John 3.16. And, and if I just started saying it now, you could finish it. For God so loved the world and you'd take it from there. But how many of us know Luke 9.23? Let's read it. Jesus said to all of them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The Gospel of Luke is making a shift today. We're in chapter 9, and, and, and it's kind of got a new focus. Last week, Dave preached, I thought, an awesome sermon on the storm, the boat and the storm. And if you didn't listen to it, I'd go back and listen to it. It was really good for my faith. But in the middle of that chaos of Jesus calming the storm, the disciples look at each other and they go like, who is this? They, even the wind and waves obey him. Who is this Jesus? And then at the beginning of chapter 9, we find the same question being asked, this time not by the disciples, but by Herod. He says, I beheaded John, who then is this I hear such things about? So, so the disciples are asking, who is this? Herod is asking, who is this? Jesus takes that question and turns it back and puts it back to the disciples a little later in John 9. He says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, God's Messiah. So like through the first eight and a half chapters of Luke, the question is, who is Jesus, and Peter gets the answer right. You're God's Messiah. Messiah means king. You are God's king. Okay, so that's what makes the next verse, Jesus' response, so weird. He says, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anyone. And you're like, well, I'm confused. I thought you were God's king. Come to earth. You're going to rally the people. We're all going to acknowledge you, worship you, follow you into Rome, and you're going to overthrow the Roman Empire and all the oppression that we have been under. But see, that's not exactly right. That's why Jesus said, don't tell anyone. Because they don't understand what kind of king Jesus is going to be. So he begins to correct some of their misconceptions in the next verse, in verse 22. He says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, and on the third day, raised to life. See, Jesus knew what was going to happen when he went to Jerusalem. He was not under the illusion that it was all going to work out okay. He wasn't surprised by any of it, by anything that happened. We might be surprised at who crucified Jesus, who killed Jesus, 
Who is against Jesus? Because notice it's the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And see, what you begin to realize as you read that that you can be lost because you run away from God. You run away from faith. You run away from religion. You can be lost because you run away from Jesus. Or you can also be very religious and still be very, very lost. Next verse, Luke 9, 23. This is when he says to everyone, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. See, the cross isn't just the way that God saves you. I mean, it is he, that. He, he dies on the cross to pay for our sin, but it's also more than that. It's also the pattern for how we are to live our life. Jesus goes to the cross to be crucified, to die, to lose his life, and then he looks at all of us and says, come, come join me. Good news, God loves you and he has a wonderful plan for your life. It's called the cross-shaped life. So let's just work through Luke 9, 23 if we can, right? You're gonna know this verse before we're done. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, Jesus invites anyone and everyone to come after him. We value things that are exclusive. If everybody has it, then we don't really want it. So there's only a tiny fraction of applicants that get into the best universities. It's only the people with the best sales numbers that get invited on the fun trip. Only those with the best resumes need apply. Country clubs, gated communities, they, they, they have value because of who they keep out. American Express reminds us that membership has its privileges. But sometimes you'll see a car dealership that says, anyone can buy a car here. But then you see an asterisk and you look down and it says, with proper credit, right? Anyone can buy a car here as long as you qualify. Is that how Jesus is? Is Jesus like, anyone can follow me as long as you qualify? Well, I don't know. Who, who has Luke been, been uh, telling us that Jesus has been inviting He's been inviting the sick and the lame, the fishermen and the tax collectors, the lepers and the paralytics, the prostitutes and the Pharisees. He's invited widows and Roman soldiers and the demonized. See, I think when Jesus said anyone can follow me, he really meant it. He really meant anyone. Were you like me that when you were a kid, if you spilled something, the last thing you wanted your mom to know, especially for whatever reason, it's always mom, uh, that you spilled something on a piece of furniture that she really liked. And so your first instinct is, okay, I've got to clean this. And so you get the wet paper towel and you're scrubbing and it never seemed to come out, right? At least it didn't for me. So what do you do in that moment? I know you've been there because we've all been there. At least, at least boys have been there. What do you do? You can't get it out and moms do home. You flip the cushion, right? I mean, that's what everybody here did, right? I mean, if you're a mom of young boys, if you go home today and you start flipping all the cushions, you're gonna find some things. I don't know what, it might be alive, but you're gonna find it, right? But that's what we do. We try to hide the stains. We flip the cushion. We protect. We keep up walls so that you don't know because we don't want you to know the stain. We're hiding that from ourselves, from each other, from whoever, right? But, but Jesus comes along and says, those stains won't keep you from following him. Like when he said, anyone and everyone can follow me, he means even the people with stains that won't come out. Luke 9, 23. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me. If anyone would come after me. I told you that Christine and I, we met in college on that mission trip with those Czech girls that eventually started following Jesus. And we got back to campus, back to Mizzou after that summer uh, that's when, just to use Jesus' language, I began to come after her. I, I started talking to her and got her to take this class with me, German Civilization, a class that I dreaded. And, and I got her to do it with me so we could study together. Of course, I got a C, so that's probably because I was distracted more by her. 
But then I wanted to go out on dates. I didn't have much money, so I started selling plasma. You can do that at, at campus, but my son does it. You can sell plasma. And I sold plasma, and part of what I use my plasma money to do is take her out on dates. I even wrote her a love poem on 1 Corinthians 13. Do I seem like the kind of guy that would write a love poem? Because I'm definitely not. And I've never done that since then, right? You know, just because I did it when we are dating doesn't mean I'm doing it when we're married, right? It's like bait and switch, yeah? Um, <laughs> but she did the same thing to me. So we're, we're, we're newly married. We're newly married. And we're living in this apartment on camp, near campus because we're on staff with Campus Crusade. And there's this freshman guy named Marty. He's in one of my Bible studies. And he came over to watch a football game or something like that. And so we're sitting there, and it's a super small apartment. So Christine's walking around, and every time she comes to the TV, she ducks down to go under the television so we wouldn't miss a play of the football game. And when she left the room, Marty goes, I want to marry a woman like that. <laughs> Marty, she hasn't ducked since that time, right? <laughs> that didn't last. But you do crazy things for people that you're trying to win their affection. You come after Jesus because you want to. You want him and you don't do it half-heartedly. Now, you don't have to come after Jesus. You can spend your life chasing and running after so many other things in this life. And if you think you found something better than him, then have at it. Chase after that because Jesus is offering us an invitation. He's not telling us we have to do this. He's inviting us to come after him, to come after him because we want a relationship with him. I want to come after Jesus because he's the best thing that I found. Kyle Eidemann says that you ever notice that people in churches, they, 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 they say things like, God wants your time, and God wants your money, and you know, God wants your worship. And he's like, well, you know what? It turns out that God doesn't need any of those things. He doesn't need your time because he's created outside of time, right? He, he, he created time. He's eternal. He doesn't need your money. The Bible says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He doesn't need your worship. Jesus said the rocks and stones will cry out if you don't. Well, he says, Kyle Eidemann says, it's not that God needs those things. He, he wants those things because he really wants you. He wants you to love him as much as he loves you. Back to Luke 9, 23. He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Deny yourself is not exactly what I would say is the slogan of our age, right? We might be more indulge yourself. If we had a slogan, it might be one more. One more cookie, one more drink, one more episode. One more outfit, one more piece of furniture, one more vacation. Because we don't like denying ourselves. We like our needs being met. Even churches get into this, right? We have to get into this. We just, it just sucks you in. Like, I, I, I want to do whatever you need. You need this, I want to meet your needs. I, I, I'm all about trying to make this as easy as place. You want to start something, you do it. It's like Burger King. You have it your way, right? That's what the crossing is like. Burger King, have it your way. We'll do whatever for you. You can have whatever you want. But then you meet Jesus. And Jesus isn't like Burger King. Jesus says, Deny yourself. You might deny yourself something good so you can have something better. Like, like, like it might be, I'm going to not deny myself the good of scrolling through my news, uh, my, you know, the, the news on my phone in the morning because I want something better. And that is to pick up my Bible and read through a gospel of Luke. I might deny myself something good like listening to the radio on the way to work so I can have something better like praying to Jesus, like praying through my day about what's coming. I might deny myself something good like going out of town a lot so I can have something better being here with you in worship or being involved in a small group. So sometimes you deny yourself some good. Sometimes you have to deny yourself something sinful. Like I've got to want Jesus more than getting drunk or want Jesus more than people's approval or want Jesus more than pornography. So sometimes I deny myself good or sometimes I have to deny myself bad. But what, what Jesus says is that every Christian is denying themselves in some way. They're denying ourselves so we can follow him. So it kind of begs the question, what have you been denying yourself so that you can have Jesus? Anything? I mean, Jesus said to deny yourself and follow him, but, but if you had to deny yourself, like, are you denying yourself something now 
something good or something bad because what you really want is Jesus? Or are you kind of into exceptions? Story of Ivan the Great, or sometimes he's called Ivan the Terrible. I guess it depends on whether you're on his good side or bad side. He was a czar of Russia, expansionist, general, very good at what he does. He, he was expanding Russia, but he didn't have a wife, therefore he didn't have any heirs, and the people thought this is a problem. So he tells them, okay, find me a wife and I'll marry her. And so they found a woman he really wanted to marry. Okay, I'll marry her. Problem, she was part of the Greek Orthodox Church, and in order to marry her, he and his soldiers had to be baptized into the Greek Orthodox Church. Okay, we'll do that. Problem is that you have to renounce violence to be baptized into the Greek Orthodox Church, and this is an expansionist general and all of his soldiers. So here's the solution. When they got baptized, they took their sword out and they held it above the water. See, I'll, like, I'll get baptized, but not my sword. What are you keeping from Jesus? What are you holding above the water? Like, I'll, I'll get baptized, I'll follow Jesus, but not my, what? Bank account, sexuality. What? what? I, I don't know, it could be anything, right? Calendar. NBC did a, a, a news story. I, I, I read it in this book, and I couldn't believe it, so I went back and I found it, and it's 100% true. They did this news story about a woman named Christy Pugh, and she had become a vegetarian later in life. And so this news story is about how she's like, yeah, I become a vegetarian. It's really easy. Here's my secret. I eat meat. Well, okay, right? I mean, I mean I'm a vegetarian too, right? I eat, I eat meat. They, they called her a flexitarian. A flexitarian, right? And here's the, in the article, I swear that she said this. Uh, she said, I really like veg, uh, you know, vegetarian food. I'm just not 100% committed. Okay. I really like Jesus. I'm just not 100% committed. Like I'm a part-time vegetarian. Okay, that probably works. Like I don't care. But can you be a part-time Christian? And what part of your life are you part-time in it? Like, when are you not a Christian? Is it the weekends? Is it when you're with a certain group of friends? Is it a certain part of your life, a certain sin that you cherish? What, 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 what is the part-time when it comes to your faith? See, Jesus, he's called Lord in the New Testament. And the Lord, Lord just meant master. So to call Jesus Lord is to call yourself his servant, his slave. So a lot of people ended up in servitude or as a slave because they were captured in war or because they had this debt they couldn't pay off, so they would hire themselves out and, and to pay off their debt. And the Old Testament law said that what you do is you would work six years to pay off that debt, and then in the seventh year, you would go free. But the law makes a provision for those who want to stay with their master. It's found, that provision is found in Deuteronomy 15, Says, but if your servant says to you, I don't want to leave you because he loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take an awl, which is kind of like a, a nail, and push it through his earlobe into the door, and he will become your servant for life. Do the same with your female servants. So because I love my, sir, my master, because I love my Lord, I, I want to stay with him and continue to be his servant by choice. And because I love Jesus, and because Jesus loves me, and because I've seen all that he is for me, and I, 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 I'm overwhelmed by his grace and his mercy and his love and his goodness in my life, that I want to be his servant. I want to be his slave. I'm willing to give up my rights. I'm willing to give up my freedom. I'm willing to die to myself because having Jesus is better. Luke 9, 23, I told you you're gonna know this. He, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now, now the cross is just an instrument of death. It was nothing more or less. It was a painful, humiliating way to die. And Jesus goes, he dies on the cross, and he says, I want you to take up your cross. It's not a mystery about what Jesus meant, right? You don't need to pray about it. You don't need to think about it. You don't need to ask your Bible study about it. Here's what he meant. He wants you to die to yourself, die to your agenda, die to your needs, now, if you're a pastor, maybe what you do too, I don't, I don't know. But if you're a pastor, you're around a lot of dead people or you have been in your life. And, and you know what dead people never do? 
Dead people never care what you think about them. I haven't met one dead person who cares what they look like or who cares about their bank account or their, they just don't care. You know what? Because they're dead. And, and so now what Jesus says, I want you to come and I want you to die. But I want you to do it, did you, did you notice that word? Daily. In other words, it's not like I make a decision one day and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna die to myself and then rah, 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 and then I'm done with it. No, 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 daily, every day, come and die to your needs. Daily, come and die to yourself that you might live for Jesus. Maybe all that sounds too radical. Like, I've had so many people in my life to say, that's all too radical, this die to yourself and take up your cross. I mean, can we keep things in perspective? Can we be balanced in life? Do you have to take this religion, faith thing to such an extreme? The guy named Robert Courtney, he, he, he did all this in Kansas City, so you may have heard of it. He was a pharmacist, and he was convicted of diluting medicine for profit. Over the course of nine years, he diluted more than 98,000 prescriptions. 4,200 people were affected, and at least 17 people died. He was watering down chemotherapy treatment. He made $19 million, but was sentenced to 30 years in prison. $19 million diluting chemotherapy treatment for his personal gain. And because he diluted it, because he watered it down, it was no longer effective. And that's why people died. So many people are going to tell you, you don't have to be radical. You don't have to take up your cross and die. You can live for Jesus and for yourself. So many people are going to tell you that you really don't have to deny yourself. Why would God want to deny you? He wants you to be happy. He wants a wonderful life for you. I don't know. Luke 9, 23. Jesus says this. I don't know. I mean, he is God. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You're never going to get to the end of your life and regret denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus. You're, you're, you're going to regret a lot of things. At least I plan on it, right? I mean, I think I will, and I'm sure you will too. We get to the end of our life, and we look back, and we go, I wish I'd done this or that. I, I regret this. You're never going to regret going all in on Jesus. He's more than worth it. He's worth your whole life. He's worth everything. Amen.